I'm actually at a little slough right here. And this is actually where my family comes camping every year for Memorial Weekend. But I figured since I had the time off, I was gonna go first and just go have fun. And so this is a little inlet that drains out from the main river. The main river goes out like this. And then this is just like a little, uh, once again, a little inlet where water just kind of pulls in. And so I pulled in over here just cause I wanted to check the campground out and the campground is looking awesome. The grass is super green while every other weeds around it is still just, you know, recovering from that winter that we just had. Spring is here, turkeys are gobbling and I am just so happy to be out here. Snow is gone, sun's out, bluebird skies. This is gonna be fun. I only have like six hours to do everything I wanna do, but this is perfect. We got a bunch of driftwood here because I do plan to cook over the fire. And so later, if we do catch fish, we have a bunch of driftwood here. And along throughout this campground, there's a lot of these uh, fire pit that I believe the Corps of Engineers have designed and designated for campfires. For example, this thing is not folded down, but you just have to push it down. So we have a campfire here. We have a table here. Uh, if we need this, it's just all my food in here, fishing rods. This is actually my box, the bowl noodles. This is actually my box I'm gonna use for target practice with my shotgun. I got my bow in the back seat. I got my target box right there. And then in the trunk over there, I have all my other stuff. Let's go and try to find these turkeys. I should have brought my turkey calls. While we drive over to go find these turkeys, some of you might be like, where have you been for like the past month? And I know I haven't been uploading a video, but that doesn't mean that I have not been out. I have been out. I've, I've actually been out fishing a handful of times. They just haven't really produced anything. I went out with my buddy Steve on his raft out to this local lake. I did catch two trout. It wasn't really anything too special, you know? And so I've been just kind of like, ah, it's not good enough to make a video. But the other thing, the more important thing is I've been doing a lot of behind the scenes things for the channel, good things, it's not anything bad. It's just that it takes a lot of my time away from coming out here and producing content, filming, editing, and stuff like that. And a lot of it has to do with these things right here. Yes, a lot of you have seen it and a lot of you are aware of it, but yes, I am currently working on my apparel. And so these are like my hats. This is my logo if you're unfamiliar with it. Back to my point, I'm trying to get these hats dialed in and not only hats, but like shirts and hoodies. And I've had a handful of prints from like different companies, but none of them have just like been what I am looking for. When I release apparel and hats to you guys, I want it to be good. I don't want it just to be merch, if you will. Like I don't want it to just be for the sake of, oh, here's some uh, low quality merch that I just slapped my logo on it. Like I want this stuff to be good. That's why it's taking me so much time and I'm doing this on my own and so I'm figuring everything out by myself, which is taking a lot of time. But like I said, this is a quality versus quantity type of deal. And so I really wanna get this thing right. That's why this past month, like I've been really just trying to get all this stuff situated so that I can release it to you guys sooner than later. But I don't have a ETA on when this stuff is gonna be done. All I know is I'm hustling and I just need you guys to be patient with me. And in between my times where I'm not just on my computer researching and stuff like that, I'm out here filming, at least trying to film, produce content. I don't know where these turkeys are. So I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that they are not on the road and they are somewhere else. With all of that said, Let's get back and let's go fishing. I don't know about you guys, but when I see stuff like this greening up, flowers blossoming, that just makes me so excited. Man, there's a lot of trash here. We'll have to come back and pick all this up. I don't have a trash bag with me, but uh, usually when you're down here by the river, 
there's a lot of trash bags provided if you go to like a legitimate uh, station where they have all those bags. I drove past a couple earlier, just didn't hit me to get a bag or two, but there's a lot of litter here. So we'll come back and pick this up. But we're gonna fish right here. So I parked my car right here. Just gonna cross the road and fish right in this little inlet right here. Yeah, I have so much stuff. I don't even know how to start. So what I have in here is this is my new shotgun, which I'll show you later. I just want my fishing stuff for now. So we're gonna take our chair. And yesterday I went to the store, bought a bunch of onions, potatoes, and you already know, pink grapefruit sparkling ice. The other thing too is I went and grabbed some night crawlers because that's what we're using today. Whenever you river fish or you just don't really know what the fish are biting on, night crawlers, that's, that's the go-to. So I also bought a bunch of salad. Didn't even buy ranch. That's a rookie move. So I'm gonna load up my pack really quick. I don't really have stuff to throw in there besides my pink grapefruit and my worms. So worst case scenario, I'll flip you guys around, is if it's really that windy, we can always just go and sit inside this little cove right here and hopefully be more protected. So we're gonna fish right here. Oh, look, there's a dead carp right there. I'll show you guys that dead carp momentarily. I'm gonna get set up first. But there is a dead carp right there. That's the thing about fishing these big rivers. There's so many different species of fish. You never know what you're gonna catch, especially when you're throwing night crawlers out. There's a lot of big carp in this river. The river's a lot lower too. Normally we have another foot of water but I think it's just been so dry these past several years. There hasn't been enough rain nor snow to really get the river to rise. I think that's good enough. So what I have on this rod is I have a micro Ned rig. So this is a Ned rig, but it's just much smaller. And then this rod right here is not rigged up. So I have to rig it up first for bottom fishing. And once I get that done, I will show you the rig and hopefully we'll catch a fish. This is a common three-way rig. Normally when you use a three-way rig, you can use a swivel that has three eyes. This is only a double eye swivel. So there's only two versus a third one, but it'll work. So right here, this is my main line. I'm running 10 pound mono as my main line. I have it tied to one eye of the swivel. And on that same eye that my main line is tied to, I have a six pound mono leader tied to a little weight. And then on the other eye of the swivel, I have a 10 pound mono uh, leader tied to a six size six bait holder hook. And that's where I have my night crawler. Cast this out. Uh, I don't really like that spot. I'm gonna aim more over here. That first cast landed right here to the right. My weight's not that heavy either. So it's not doing a very good job of bucking the wind. Try this again. That's a little bit better. Right in the middle. Put in this rod holder. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm trying my best to always face my GoPro, which is my microphone, away from the wind. So like the wind's blowing from my back and I'm putting on my chest. That way my body is blocking the wind so that the audio isn't as messed up. We are playing with a little bit of current and this spot can be pretty snaggy. So I don't really know what to expect. I don't think I'm gonna put a bell on there because that bell is going to be constantly ringing which might just get annoying after a little bit. We'll just keep an eye out on it. I think we can distinguish the difference between a fish bite and the wind blowing.
Oh, am I getting hit? I think this is a fish. This has got to be a fish. Oh yeah, that's a fish. Fish on. Let's go. <laughs> Took us like, what, five minutes? Doesn't feel big at all. Oh yeah. Feels so good to finally have another fish on. What is this? I'm guessing a pea mouth. Hardly fighting. Pea mouth. All right. So this is the crazy thing. I do not remember the last time that I have ate a pea mouth. So when I came down here, I was like, I'm gonna try cooking up a pea mouth. So, since we caught a pea mouth, it's exactly what we're gonna do. I think way back then we used to eat these guys, but after a while, I think we just stopped for whatever reason. And nowadays when we catch pea mouth, which is this fish right here, we usually just use this as cut bait. So we would catch a pea mouth, we would cut it up and throw it out for catfish. But today, we're gonna try and actually try eating one of these. I, I don't know the last time I ate it. I don't remember ever eating a pea mouth, so I don't really know what they taste like. I'm assuming they have white meat. So uh, yeah, we got ourselves a fish to try out. That's why they call them pea mouth right there, that little mouth. So we have 10 pound mono tied to a big piece of wood. And then we have the line going through his mouth tied to a small piece of wood. That way the line gets held by the stick so that when he tries to go, the stick just goes up against his nose and he can't escape. But we can keep him alive. It's very simple. Now we just gotta make sure that the stick doesn't go in the water when he pulls. So we're gonna stick this stick right in this little crevice right here. That way when he pulls, it kind of just gets stuck here this rock for extra security and put it right on top of the stick. So now the stick is secured. We have the line that goes into the fish right there. Let's get back to fishing. Let me check what time it is. It's 12.30. I think we'll fish until two o'clock. So we'll give it another hour 30. And then whatever we catch between now and then, we'll just head on over to our other stuff we gotta do. An hour 30 minutes, alarm is set. Uh, uh, you got my fish. That bird just tried to steal my fish. Oh, I gotta defend my, I gotta defend my fish. What's up? You little thief. He got clawed right here. Where did that thief go? Flying right here. 
There's a big old carp over here that you can go eat. Why do you want my little fish? Come on, leave me alone, man. Look at him. This is my fish, thank you very much. I decided to come and fish down by my fish. That way I can wash my rod and wash my fish at the same time. Cause we got a thief bird. Yep, that's a fish. Come on, I need commitment. He might be nibbling on it. Oh, there's two lizards now. So much going on. This is the problem with these pea mouth. They don't bite very hard and they don't really commit. They come up, they bite it, they let go. Oh, he might be on there actually. He was on there the whole time. <laughs> uh, I think he popped off. Dang it. I gotta reposition my worm because maybe he just didn't have the hook in his mouth. <sighs> so the fish are biting. I'm just not being a very good fisherman right now. These lizards right here. I think they're coming out and sunbathing on the rocks because all these rocks are absorbing heat. But I don't know a lot about lizards. So I could be totally wrong here. But like I could feel myself just warming up and I can feel these rocks warming up and it feels like these lizards are coming out and they're just like hugging these rocks to warm up or something. They kind of make me a little nervous just because I'm not the biggest fan of slimy little creatures like these and snakes. That was a big hit. What am I doing? Fish on. Feels like a much better one. <laughs> Finally, these fish are here. Maybe they've been biting this whole time. I just haven't developed that eye to really pick, pick out these bites. Feels like another pea mouth. Yep, another pea mouth. Got him. No escape this time. Oh, he popped off. So these are like pretty average size pea mouth. And again, we don't normally eat them. And so I have no idea how they taste. And so I only need one. So we're gonna let this guy go. We just appreciate the, the fun. And it just feels good to be catching fish, man. I've been on not the hottest streak of catching fish. So I will take catching fish when I can. But this is why I love river fishing. 
even though one fish might not be one species might not be super active around that time of year another species might be very active i think springtime is just a great time to be outside i think everybody gets over cabin fever pretty quick that's why i decided to opt down here and if you didn't know if you're new this is basically the place where i grew up and fell in love with fishing my family would come down here pretty much every summer and we still do and we would come down here just to camp fish for whatever and this is really where my love for fishing sparked and so it's really awesome to just still be here you know it's such a blessing to still be able to fish here and catch pea mouth like this Pea mouth was something we caught a lot back then and we're still catching pea mouth today. Like that's a blessing in its own just to be able to say that. There's gotta be a sucker fish roaming around with these pea mouth, I'm assuming. Getting hit. That's a fish. Oh, this is a this is a big fish. Oh, oh, much nicer fish. Maybe a sucker fish. Maybe this is the sucker fish I have been waiting for. I don't know, much better fish. It could be a catfish, actually. Oh, oh, oh I need to loosen my drag. Oh, let's go. There's a cart that just jumped right there. River fishing, man, I'm telling you. Oh, 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 whoa, 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 What? Okay, I'm just confused now. So I'm playing with really light line, so I have to let my drag go really loose. He's got head shakes like a catfish. It's not like a pea mouth where it's just like a torpedo. It's got a lot of slow bouncing head shakes. Oh, that's a sucker fish right there. I knew there had to be a sucker fish in here. Did I not call that? I called that. I was like, I know there's a sucker fish in here with all of these pea mouth. Oh, what a stud. Oh, nice sucker fish. Sucker fish, sucker fish. Oh. Sucker fish, that's why they call a sucker fish because their lip is literally like a vacuum. They just go on the bottom and they just suck food off the bottom. Just like my piece of worm, this right here is a sucker fish. They're not the most gorgeous looking fish, but they sure are fun to catch. And I love catching them because they just always put up a fight. And so I'm gonna unhook them. It would actually be a, pretty interesting to catch and cook a sucker fish one day i don't know too much about sucker fish in terms of like bacteria and like mercury levels and stuff like that but today we already have our little pea mouth so we're gonna let this guy go i don't want to play with him too much there he goes you gotta love river fishing what a piece of night crawler, man. You don't know where you're ever gonna catch. We're gonna cast this thing back out. We're just gonna fish until our timer's up. I put a timer for two o'clock and I think we're like at 140. So we have 
it's a little bit more time to go. I was really actually thinking that that was a catfish just by the big head shakes. But it kind of makes sense now because not only do catfish do those head shakes, but catfish will actually roll around. But that suckerfish never rolled around. He just had a bunch of big head shakes. And again, I am using a five foot six rod. So it's not big at all. It's like it's a pretty short rod and it's a light action rod. So those average size fish like that sucker fish, they feel a little bit bigger on these smaller rods. Cast it back out. Maybe we'll catch fish number four. My pea mouth is up along the shoreline now. Help him out now. There you go. First victim, angry orchard. Guys, first off, don't litter. Two, if you get to a place where there is litter, pick up the trash. It gets annoying, if I'm being honest, to just go to a place like this where it's like so beautiful out, and you look at the ground, and it's like dirt and garbage everywhere. Like, what the heck is this? Heineken. Another victim. Burger King. Celsius. I've never heard of that before. Mountain Dew. Coors Light. Monster. Red Bull. Man, we're finding all sorts of brands of drinks out here. We're even finding gummies. What is this? Your little nectarines or oranges. We even found a Gatorade bottle out here. Man, what is this? Gravy mix. Another Coors Light. What is this? Another Coors Light? Come on, man. Coors Light, you guys are losing here. I have the most Coors Light of anything. I think it looks pretty clean. We can head on over. Oh, guess what? Another Coors Light. This time it's in a glass bottle instead of a can. Doesn't matter though. Just for picking that stuff up, always make sure you have some kind of hand sanitization on you. Uh, two o'clock. I'm getting hungry, so it's time to go cook. But on a serious note, guys, the land around the river, in this case, Corpse of Engineers, provide trash bags for you guys. Like if they provide trash bags for free for the public, like there really is no excuse to litter like that. Anyway, we're gonna head on over and go cook, make a good old fire, go cook, test out this pea mouth, and also make a delicious elk steak. Well, we just pulled up to our little camping spot. And earlier, I knew I was not just hearing things. I found them. Two hens. It's not the gobbler though. We are back. This time, the winds die down a little. 
so I don't think we have to worry about that too much. Got a campfire here, got a table there, got plenty of wood right there. We have everything we need to start cooking. Got a bunch of geese right behind the camera. Let's cook. And then we gotta go shoot our bow. I might shoot my bow right here, but I have to go shoot my shotgun somewhere else. Whenever you have a log pile like this, always make sure you clear it out first before you just go and reach your hand in there. There might be a rattlesnake in there or something. So we're just clearing this out, making sure there's no rattlesnakes in here. So everything looks good. Now that everything looks good, pick all of this up, start a fire. Just trying to let this fire burn and give me a coal base so that I can cook. Here's my fish. He's kind of dried up. I don't really know how I'm gonna prep him yet because I don't think I have ever prepped a pea mouth in my life. I've always just cut it up into chunk bait for catfish. Never once in my life have I ever processed a pea mouth to eat. So we'll figure that out together. I got a potato here. I also have a bunch of onions and then I have the sirloin tip of one of the elk that I've killed that I've been fortunate enough to harvest. Just got oil. I've got Montreal steak seasoning for the elk meat. And then I have this fish monger fisherman's blend for the white fish. I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scale them. I think I'm going to try. Oh, he's, he's really dry because he's been sitting in the car. It's all good though. Actually, you know what? Let's go and uh, wet him in the water because these scales aren't flying off. In fact, we'll just scale him down here. Whenever you're scaling fish, always make sure you get the scales right behind the fins like these. That's often the spots where most people tend to miss and they wonder why they're eating scales we all know about the scales on the body but make sure you always get the ones by the fins especially the belly i don't think a lot of people realize that these fish have scales on the belly i'm just going to process this like a trout start from the belly and we're going to cut up towards its head here and we're going to smash this head off Pull all these guts out as one. Just come back over here and rinse all this stuff off. Clean just like a trout, scaled, gutted out, cut off the head. A lot of white meat. Beautiful chunk of elk meat right there. So while we're waiting for the potato, or I guess the potato over here, I wanna just get you guys up to speed on my turkey plans. In fact, turkey season opens in two days. Today's Thursday, it opens on Saturday. I won't be able to go out 
until Monday, which is the day that this video is releasing. So the day that you are watching this, if you're watching this on the day of upload, I'm actually out turkey hunting. But this year, got some new gadgets that I'm super excited to test out. So this year, one of my goals is to shoot a turkey with a bow. And I finally got my own bow. This is actually my buddy's bow that he sold to me. So this is the Bowtech Realm X. My buddy sold it to me, got me a good deal on it. And I couldn't pass it up because every hunter at some point in their lives needs a bow. And so this is the Bowtech Realm X. It's a 50 to 60 pound bow. I have it maxed out right now. So it's like 63-ish pounds or something like that. And then on the stabilizer, I just have the Bee Stinger Micro Hex. I have a black gold verdict ascent three pin sight. I have a tight spot arrow quiver. And then for the arrow rest right here, I just have a QAD arrow rest. It's a drop away rest. And so since I'm just going on a turkey hunt, I decided to build my own arrows for the first time. I've never really built, an, I've actually never built any arrows on my own before until now. And so I figured instead of starting with some big game like deer or elk, I'd start practicing my build arrows on something like a turkey where I would say it's a lot easier to kill them, even if your setup isn't quote unquote ideal, right? And so this year I built my own arrows and let me put this bow down for a second. I just kind of went according to the spine chart of a gold tip. And so these are the gold tip Hunter XT arrows. These are the 400 spine just because my draw length, which is 27 inches at 60 pounds, that's what Gold Tip recommends for the arrows. And so I just have the Gold Tip knock. These are the knocks that come standard with it. And then for my fletchings, I was planning to fletch, like glue my fletchings on there, but I bought this arrow or fletching wrap where basically you put it around the vein or your shaft of your arrow, and then you dip in hot water and this just shrink wraps and it just like holds onto your arrow. So this was like a complete miss buy. I did not mean to buy this wrap right here or this shrink wrap, uh, arrow fletching, whatever you want to call this. I was planning to glue it, but for the sake that this is what I bought, I just kind of went with it. And so, so far it's been shooting good. My bow is tuned and all my arrows are really consistent. So again, this is my first time building arrows. So I don't really know what I was doing. And then for broadheads, I decided to go with a one and a half inch cutting diameter broadhead. So these right here are the new archery products or NAP Spitfire broadheads. So they're expandable, meaning when you shoot them, they fly out very small like a field tip, but when they impact, these blades open up. And when they open up, they provide a much larger cutting diameter. So that's basically my bow right there, my bow setup for turkeys. But that's my bow. The other thing is, my new shotgun, so let me show you. Here she is. This is a shotgun that I received two days ago. Just got it right before season, and it's my first ever semi-auto shotgun. So this right here is the Rite Gordian uh, Turkey Shotgun. So Rite is the brand, Rite USA. The Gordian is the name of the shotgun model, and the Turkey is well, that means that this, tur this shotgun was designed for a turkey. So, I mean, it's a shotgun, so there's not much to show. But for turkey, again, whenever you go turkey hunting, you always want to have a turkey choke on there. So for this one, I went with the Jebs Headhunter Turkey Choke. I believe this is a 0 .560 uh, restriction. And then I also threw on the Vortex uh, Spark Solar Red Dot on there because if you guys watched my turkey hunting videos from last year, 2022, it was my first season using a red dot on my turkey shotgun. And never will I ever go turkey hunting without a red dot again in my life. Because when you use a red dot, like your peripheral, when you're aiming on that turkey is just way better. Like you can see the entire turkey versus when you're just looking down the barrel, like the barrel covers so much of the turkey that taking longer shots and that turkey is a lot smaller that bead can really cover up where you're actually aiming, but because you have a red dot and the red dot is so fine and you can see all around the red dot, I feel like you have a much better visual of where you're actually aiming on the turkey. And so this is, again, the Vortex uh, Spark Solar. I have this on my 12 gauge at home as well, but I love this red dot so much that I got a second one. So again, this is not a 12 gauge, this is a 20 gauge. And then the last thing is 
this thing, the Beartooth products. Cheek riser, just because I have a red dot on here and it's sitting a little higher off the barrel, I needed the cheek riser piece so that I can properly look through the red dot. So that right there is something that we will go shoot for the first time after we eat. So I had to cut the fish into two because it wasn't gonna fit in our pan. And I'm also cooking this right by this post because I forgot the little balancer for my propane and so I need that post to balance it. Not gonna lie, that meat actually looks pretty good. White meat looks just like walleye, whitefish. I hope I can draw with this GoPro on. Yeah, it's not a problem. So it's a little windy, but we'll see how this goes. 15 yards on the money. That's a, that's a field tip. So the other one I have is this guy. This is a practice broadhead. So it's not the actual broadhead, but it's also designed by NAP, which makes the broadhead I have. And supposedly this practice broadhead is supposed to fly exactly how the broadheads actually do. But because I'm shooting a foam target, if I was shooting my actual broadhead, it would just cut open that foam target. So we're gonna use this practice head to mimic shooting broadheads. So that first shot was field tip. We'll try this one with the practice head. Not too shabby. I'm always scared of Robin hooding my arrows. And so I tried not to aim in the same exact spot. So my elk steak is currently cooking on the stove. And this potato, I'm gonna eat with my steak. But since we caught this pea mouth, and I've never tried pea mouth before, at least I don't recall trying it, we're gonna see how it tastes. So all we did was we threw in this fish seasoning, threw it in some oil, added some onions just to give that onion flavor to it. That's all I did. I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. That way we don't have things that drown out the natural flavor of pea mouth. I'm actually a little bit nervous to try this pea mouth if I am being honest with you. So we have a very good crust on the outside. That meat is wonderfully white and I can already tell this is gonna be a very bony fish. I just cut open that part towards the tail and there's like bones everywhere. <laughs> so uh, this might be a very bony fish. Nonetheless, it's white meat so here we go. Bones, holy bones. Bones everywhere. Bones are one thing, flavor is another thing. The meat actually is very good. Just so many bones. And they're not the big bones. These are, I believe, again, I don't know the anatomy of pea mouth, so I don't know if these are, oh, they're Y bones. They're not pin bones. These are Y bones. So there's essentially bones that run throughout the body, which is making it not the ple most pleasant eating experience, but in terms of flavor and texture of the meat, it's phenomenal. It really is. I'm just picking out every little bone I see here, which there's a lot. If it wasn't for all of these bones, I think I would definitely target pea mouth more often than I do. But perhaps this is why people don't really eat pea mouth. It's just so bony. Like, 
there's all these Y bones throughout this meat. I mean, you, you can pull out another one here. Like it's just super bony. So it doesn't take away from the, the flavor and the deliciousness of the meat. It's more of the cumbersome of eating the meat. I think I could give you my final verdict. Flavor and texture wise for the meat, nine out of 10. Easiness of eating, three out of 10. Super cumbersome to eat, but it's delicious. This piece of sirloin right here is pretty thick cut, so I'm not sure if I got down to the inside, but. Oh, I think that's perfect. Oh, that is perfect right there. That's just how I like my elk meat. Sirloin tip from the elk. Montreal steak seasoning. I don't know how it gets much better than that. I have my target box set up roughly at 30 yards. I forgot my range finder, so I'm just kind of guessing here. And normally when I sight in my red dot, I like to sight it in at 30 yards. I think at 20 yards, it's kind of a no brainer that you're gonna be patterning somewhat good. But the thing with the 20 gauge is, ammo is so hard to find for 20 gauge, at least turkey loads. I went to the store, found a bunch of like target loads and like geese and duck loads, waterfowl loads but I couldn't find one single box of turkey loads. And so I kind of just bought with what I think is good. And so what I ended up buying was this box, well actually three of them. And these are the Kent cartridge tungsten matrix. And these are actually waterfowl loads. However, due to the fact that I had no other options, I just kind of had to go with it because a lot of the other options were like size three and size two and size one, which in Washington, for turkey, your shot size has to be uh, smaller than uh, size four. And so with shotguns, it's a little bit backwards, right? So a shot size five is smaller than a shot size four, and a shot size six is smaller than so shot size five. And so legally, you can't use anything uh, below the number four. So shot size three, two, one, Bs or BB, like all of those are illegal to use for turkey hunting. And so this was about the only thing I found legal for turkey hunting. And so these are tungsten, they're not lead. And a lot of people have been raving about tungsten shells. The reason why I haven't been using it until now is because they are expensive. This one box of 10 rounds was 60 bucks. I spent a hundred $80, not including tax, for three boxes of these. I guess that's my only complaint about the 20 gauge. There's just not a lot of ammo. So anyway, with that being said, I have a target box set up at 30 and we have to side in our red dot, line up our red dot with our pattern. Yes, you actually do have to side in your red dot. And so we're gonna take our first shot and hopefully by the end of this first box, hopefully it doesn't take me 10 shells, we can have it patterned at 30 yards and we'll call it good and we can go look for some turkeys. So these are three inch shells. That's the shell right there. Again, I have not sighted this in at all. And so I have no idea how this is gonna go. So I'm gonna turn on this red dot by just pressing this plus a bunch of times. And when I do that, my red dot should come alive and we'll call it good. All right, here we go. Kicks, not as bad as a 12 gauge, but we'll go take a look. This might be closer to a 40 yard shot. And at 40 yards, you can see our pattern isn't the greatest. So I'm actually gonna backtrack. We're gonna go to 20 and we're just gonna start at 20, really get my red dot. For all I know, I could be hitting, like most of my BBs could be hitting over here and I just don't even know about it. And so I think we're gonna shoot 20 first, put a new piece of paper on there, shoot at 20 get the red dot lined up and then we'll pattern our gun. I just went through my first box of these shells. And like I said, these are waterfowl loads. So I'm not expecting super, super tight patterns like my turkey loads on my 12 gauge. 
But so far, they're not bad. Like I've had worse. But again, I think with just how it's been patterning, it'll kill a turkey. And so I sighted this red dot in. It's elevation and windage is right around what I would deem accurate. With a shotgun, you're shooting spread shots. So it's like you're kind of just guessing as to where the majority of your pellets are going, right? It's not like a single bullet hole from like a rifle where you shoot and there's one hole and you know exactly where it's hitting. With a shotgun, it's just spread shot. So it's like, you're kind of just guessing how much you need to adjust in terms of elevation and windage. So I'm gonna back up to 30 yards, which I'm already here. And if this one shoots good, then I'm gonna call it good on the 20 gauge. This trigger is just so heavy. It's a six pound trigger. So that was probably closer to like a 35 yard shot. And like I said, with waterfowl loads, I'm not expecting super, super tight patterns out of my shotgun, but let's say 35 yards. I mean, that's a dead turkey. So Again, it's not a 12 gauge, so I should probably remember that simply because it's a 20 gauge, it's a smaller gauge. So there's less BB overall in the shell. And so I'm, I shouldn't be surprised that it's not as full as a 12 gauge. But for 30, 35 yards with that pattern right there, I'll take it with a 20 gauge and we'll call her good. Side it in, if that was a turkey, that's a flopping turkey right there. So with that said, I am signing off here for now, and I will see you when we are chasing turkeys. Good luck this spring if you're after turkeys.